Hello, I'm Dr. Christopher Thompson from Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. And it's a pleasure to be uh, speaking with you again. My next topic is endoscopic GERD therapy and Barrett's esophagus. Uh, here are my disclosures. I'd like to start by covering some background and some elements of the diagnosis of GERD and Barrett's esophagus, and then move on to the endoscopic therapies. Here we have a slide illustrating the timeline of gastroesophageal reflux disease with some elements of endoscopy as well. You can see in 1868, the first gastroscopy is performed by Kuzmal. In 1907, we have foreign body removals and, and uh, tissue biopsies performed by Shelby A. Jackson. In 1923, the first atlas of the gastroscopy was published by Rudolf Schindler. Then in 1935, we have the first characterization of peptic esophagitis by, by Professor Asher Winkelstein, who is the chief of GI at Mount Sinai, New York. Uh, shortly after this, in 1946, um, we have uh, the uh, description of Barrett's esophagus, uh, initially by uh, Dr. Philip Roland Allison, who is a professor at the University of Oxford, and is subsequently named after uh, Dr. Barrett. Then in 1957, we have the fibroscope developed, and then in 2000, the BARD anti-reflux device. This was in part due to efforts by Paul Swain and, and Pete Lucan. And then of course in 2006, we start to have some more clinical developments in the Montreal definition and classification of GERD regurgitation with subsequent work. GERD is a very prevalent condition. Uh, you can see here uh, the nations in red and orange have a, a 25 to 34% prevalence of, of the condition. And uh, yellow is you know, 15 to nearly 20%. Um, and it's a little, little less common uh, here in Asia, but still very, uh, very problematic condition. It's important to understand the uh, anatomy of the gastroesophageal junction to understand how we're trying to, to treat uh, this condition. And when we think about uh, important anatomic elements, we think of the circular muscles of the esophagus, we think about the diaphragm, and we think of the phrenoesophageal ligament. However, there is much more to consider. Uh, here we have the uh, extrinsic components of the uh, gastroesophageal junction, and these are very important. We have the uh, costal portions of the diaphragm, which do provide some support. We also have the very important crural elements, such as the right cruce of the diaphragm, which uh, forms a sling around that intra-abdominal esophagus and is a very important part of the anti-reflux. There are also some important and specific intrinsic components beyond just the circular muscles of the, uh, of the, of the esophagus, the intra-abdominal esophagus here. There's also the clasp and sling fibers of the gastric cardia, and these play a very important role in that anti-reflux barrier. You can see here how the sling fibers are pulling down, helping to accentuate that angle of hiss, and the clasp fibers are closing it off um, horizontally here. Um, very important elements. This figure illustrates the components of the high pressure zone of the uh, gastroesophageal junction. And you can see the tracing in red is the combination of both the intrinsic smooth muscle component in blue and the extrinsic striated muscle in green and those are the diaphragmatic components. And they were able to uh, differentiate these by having subjects uh, placed under general anesthesia and either giving them atropine to silence the smooth muscle elements or giving them cystatricurium to silence the striated muscle components. And you can see these, the, uh, the intrinsic component has two distinct spikes, the A and B spike. And uh, A is thought to be due to the circumferential muscles of the intra-abdominal esophagus and B is thought to be due to the, the clasp and sling fibers of the gastric cardia. And uh, what's very interesting here is this is in a normal subject, uh, but below here in a, in a subject with reflux, they specifically lose that second spike. And this is, this is very common where they lose uh, that second spike. And that suggests some pathology in, in, the, uh, in the clasp and sling fibers. And we typically would see this with a hill grade two or three. If the subject or patient would have a substantial hiatal hernia, the green and blue spikes would be markedly separated as well as uh, take on a different form. 
Uh, next, we have Hill grade. It's a very important part of the endoscopic examination while we're looking at the gastroesophageal junction. And uh, you can see here a Hill grade one is normal, and you have a nice uh, intra abdominal esophagus, a nice ridge here as well. You can see Hill grade two. This uh, you still you still have a, a fairly well defined ridge. However, this starts to open up, especially with respirations. A uh, Hill grade three, you have a complete effacement of that of that ridge. You see, it's open. And Hill grade four, of course, you have a uh, a hiatal hernia. It's 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 quite wide. Uh, there are more nuances to this. Uh, you can see here, uh, you know, in A, it's a, a normal subject has a very acute angle here at the angle of his. And you can even just have blunting of this and, 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 and have that be related to the development of reflux. You don't need to have something more dramatic. Um, so there are subtleties in the whole grade. Now, making the diagnosis of a gastroesophageal reflux disease has been complicated over the years. Uh, of course, we have the Demetra score, which is uh, a complex a system of looking at standard deviations. Um, of, of, of these different categories, including you know, reflux in a rep recumbent period, uh, uh, total reflux events, uh, longest episodes, upright, et cetera. And then you have you know, a range here of anything greater than 14.72 being considered abnormal. Uh, and then you, you can see you know, a greater than 100 is considered you know, severe reflux, and there's a spectrum between the two. More recently, the Lyon consensus helped to simplify this. And you can see here, uh, the important elements are endoscopic, pH impedance, or, or high resolution manometry. And uh, conclusive evidence for pathologic reflux uh, includes LA grade C or D esophagitis, long segment Barrett's mucosa, or peptic esophageal strictures on endoscopy, or acid exposure time of greater than 6% with a pH of less than four. So, uh, you know, this is conclusive. Uh, then we have uh, down here, you know, evidence against pathologic reflux is an acid exposure time of less than 4% uh, or less than 40 episodes of reflux. And in the middle, we have kind of the gray zone again. So moving on to endoscopic therapies. And, uh, you know, the goal of these therapies uh, are often to tighten either the, you know, intra-abdominal esophageal uh, sphincter or the clasp fibers, as well as to pull down on these sling fibers. So this is how these procedures are being developed, and that's what we're going to focus on. So the original device that focused on this was the barred endocinch, and this was FDA approved in the United States in, in 2000, and I spent a good amount of my time in fellowship actually working with this device. Uh, the goal was to place between two and six interrupted stitches at the gastroesophageal junction. It was a suction-based suturing device. So you can see here tissues being aspirated into the device. A, uh, a hollow needle is passed through the tissue and drops a little T-tag in the chamber, and then the whole device was removed, and the process was repeated. And the idea would be that this would cause submucosal fibrosis and change the compliance of the gastroesophageal junction. Over 5,000 patients were performed in the United States, and there was improvements in symptoms and in pH, with 25 to 50% of patients off medications at two years. However, there was concerns about longer-term durability. There were some interesting physiologic studies uh, published using this device. And you can see here, this is ultrasound and manometric pressure tracings. And the blue is the uh, pressure before the procedure is performed, okay? And uh, you, know, you can see distance away from the, uh, from the diaphragm here. And uh, yellow is the post uh, pressure. So it's substantially higher. And again, they're working kind of um, in that intra abdominal esophagus. So, and there's different elements here to it, but clearly, even placing just, you know, very superficial, honestly, interrupted stitches with that old barred device was able to change the pressure and the characteristic of this lower esophageal sphincter. However, there were many other devices as well. There were injectable substances. Uh, there were, um, you know, other, other suction-based suturing devices and plication devices and staplers. And uh, they all really pretty much, uh, you know, were unsuccessful and have since disappeared. However, we do have a couple of devices uh, that are being successfully used currently. And uh, this is a uh, procedure called the TIF-2. You can see the device is placed and, and, and positioned in a retroflex orientation. And then a helix grabs tissue at the GEJ and pulls it down into the device. The device is 
kind of twisted and then these H fasteners are deployed. Then we think you get some fibrosis and scarring of that to make it a rather permanent change in a nice 270 degree wrap. Here's one of my patients uh, and I'll show you some elements of the procedure. So you can see the lower esophageal sphincter is it's a little loose, not uh, particularly concerning, uh, probably a whole grade two. And uh, we've placed the device. There's no big hernia here or anything like that. If, the, if you have greater than a two centimeter hiatal hernia or greater than a hill grade two, it's uh, not necessarily the best uh, patient to start with here. And so, so again, use a helix device to grab that tissue at the uh, gastroesophageal junction there near the Z-line. And then you adjust the, uh, the tissue grasper and rotate it. You rotate towards the lesser curve, uh, depending, uh, regardless of which side you're on. Then you fire those H-fasteners, unscrew the helix, and um, open the jaws. Now, you're going to repeat this several times at each station. And uh, so you repeat that a few times at that station, and you can see one of the H-fasteners there. We're then going to rotate over to the, uh, the other side and repeat the process initially. Um, placing that helix into the tissue right around the Z-line there. You acquire the tissue, then you're going to open the jaws up of the device so you can kind of see where that is and pull the tissue deeply into the device. I'm going to get it above that blue line. And then uh, you're going to close the jaws partially and again rotate. This, this is an important element of the procedure, this rotational element. The jaws are then tightly closed and the H fastener is fired and you know, repeat that a few times again. And that's that's what the procedure is like. So um, we're not showing all of the plications, just yeah, just enough to give you an idea. So afterwards, this is what it looks like. So it's a little tighter going through this GEJ. You can see one of the uh, H fasteners there. Certainly more snug trying to drive through this. And then we're going to go into a retroflexion. You see that valve, that nice 270 degree valve, nice and plump. And this patient did very well. And this is a, a very a typical appearance uh, following the procedure. So this uh, procedure has evolved over time. Originally, um, you know, it was it was called the ELF procedure, and you can see here these are this this represents the Z line of the esophagus, right, in the high pressure zone, and uh, you can see kind of the gold standard over here is the Nissen, and you have uh, increase in pressure uh, uh, identified by the width of this this pressure here um, in that high pressure zone. Initially, the ELF procedure, the original embodiment of this procedure, it was a high pressure zone, but it was much lower. Okay, it was much deeper into the stomach. And then with the TIF-1, it, it improved. And with TIF-2, the current uh, procedure and device I just showed you, it looks much more like a Nissen fundoplication with, you know, this, this uh, augmenting of the high pressure zone. There are several different clinical trials uh, that have studied this device. So there's lots of evidence for its use. And you can see here, there's some I'm going to touch on, the European sham trial, the RESPECT trial, TEMPO, and then two uh, single center prospective descriptive studies as well that have rather long follow-up of uh, five and 10 years. And we'll start with uh, the European sham study. This was a multi-center randomized single blind controlled study uh, comparing TIF versus sham. And uh, the primary outcome was time to symptom recurrence in PPI-dependent GERD patients. So the population here are, are patients who have reflux that's well-managed uh, well on PPIs, but they can't come off the PPIs. This is a one-to-one -one, uh, uh, ratio of TIF with placebo, 22 patients, versus sham with PPI, another 22 patients. So here we see the primary outcome, again, being time to symptom recurrence over six months. And you can see that uh, the treatment group here in blue had a much longer time to recurrence of symptoms than the sham group on PPIs. Um, and 59% uh, yeah, of the TIF patients remained in clinical remission and off PPIs at six months. A significant reduction was also seen in total acid reflux time in the TIF versus sham groups, which was statistically significant. Um, and normalization of acid exposure time was seen in 69% of TIF patients versus only 20% of the sham patients. Median GERD symptom scores improved significantly in the TIF group um, as well. Moving on to the RESPECT trial, this is a multi-center randomized single blind controlled uh, study looking at TIF and placebo versus sham and PPI. 
Um, and the main outcome they're looking at here is truly regurgitation uh, as per the Montreal definition. There's a two to one randomization scheme, um, 87 patients in the treatment group and 42 in the control. So results, uh, the primary outcome here was uh, again, elim elimination of troublesome, troublesome regurg regurgitation. 67% um, of the TIF placebo group achieved that and only 45% of the sham achieved that. Secondary outcomes of interest, a mean number of reflux episodes, um, mean percent total time, the pH is less than four, and mean Demeester score. And all of these improved with statistical significance in the TIF group. None of them improved with statistical significance in the sham group. So that's moving well. So we're just going to go to the 10-year uh, uh, prospective descriptive study here. Um, and, uh, you know, the goal here was really to evaluate the safety and efficacy of TIF in a broad range of herd patients. And uh, you can see here, again, the various uh, scoring systems, the uh, health-related quality of life, uh, heart burden, regurgitation indices. And you can see right out to 10 years, these things are, are, uh, are maintained pretty well with uh, you know, good results. And then here we have the, the percentage of people that were able to stop their PPIs, okay, in purple. So a good percentage, over 41% over, over out to 10 years, are able to, uh, you know, stop, just come off their PPIs uh, completely versus, you know, having of the PPIs, taking half the dose. So uh, still quite, uh, quite impressive um, a number of people off their PPIs. They also shed some insight onto uh, or into um, which patients do better with this device. And you can see here, Hill grade one and two patients tended to do better, okay, in green here, uh, versus, uh, you know, the partial responders, these are complete responders, in red. Um, so the majority of people with Hill grade one and two did, did quite well, whereas if you have Hill grade three or four, you have more of the, uh, the subjects that were partial responders versus complete responders. So that's, that's an indication that those patients would do better. Again, uh, hiatal hernia less than two centimeters, you have more responders in that group versus greater than two centimeters, you have more non-responders in that group. And uh, um, number of fasteners also seems to play a role. It's important to do that as well. So um, next we have a meta-analysis by Dr. Tom McCarty. He looked at 32 studies and over 1,400 patients. And again, across the board, all the various quality metrics showed significant improvement in the TIF groups. Additionally, uh, you have a reduction in acid exposure time, which is uh, quite significant, and uh, roughly 90% of patients off PPIs, but this is, this is again only at one year. And it's very safe. The safety profile is illustrated here with a SAE rate of about 0.42% or 92 uh, events out of 22,000 cases. Uh, and you can see there's uh, some perforations here, some uh, pleural effusions, and the things you'd expect to see, um, you know, with endoscopic procedures, but really quite a, a safe procedure. Moving on to a different device. Uh, this is the, you know, the Apollo overstitch, and uh, Ken Chang has done some nice work with this. You can see before and after pictures, and he studied 10 patients, and he found that this actually gets, uh, you know, early promising results, not a lot of data here, no controlled data, but uh, this is a work. And we have similarly been working on a new approach uh, using a plicating device instead of uh, sutures. And we place these circumferentially around the intra-abdominal esophagus, and then uh, also uh, down along the sling fibers, trying to tighten those sling fibers. And uh, the secondary uh, procedure of tightening those sling fibers really is also helping us uh, introduce a weight loss component to this procedure. So this might be good for people that are, uh, you know, uh, suffering with obesity as well. Here you can see uh, the distensibility index and it's rather loose, lower esophageal sphincter. And again, our, our approach here of placing applications circumferentially around the intra-abdominal esophagus. And then uh, again, we're gonna place them kind of longitudinally. Quickly, let you see what this looks like. A traditional approach there of having a lesser curve either up at 12 o'clock or between 12 and 1. Requiring tissue, full thickness tissue. We're going to take a deep grasp of that, pass a hollow needle through the tissue, and deploy a tissue anchor distally. Open that up, 
deploy a second one proximally, and then snug them down. We can really tighten that tissue up around that uh, distal esophagus. So that's what it looks like in the anti-reflux portion. And then we go on to, uh, to pull the stomach down as well. Uh, but I guess we're going to tighten that up a little more, and then, then we'll start pulling it down. But uh, you get the idea. It looks very similar to a TIF, but we're also shortening the stomach and working on those wrestling fibers. So moving on to uh, this is an ACG clinical guideline regarding the diagnosis and management of Barrett's esophagus. And you can see at the top, if you have a flat uh, columnar mucosa and uh, you perform systematic cold biopsies, uh, then you have these results that can occur. And uh, you can have non dyslastic Barrett's, which then you would repeat the EGD with biopsy in three to five years. Um, if you have indefinite uh, pathology there for dysplasia, you're going to optimize the PPI therapy and repeat the EGD. And then if you, uh, if you uh, have a, a discordant finding, you're going to manage the new histology. And if it's the same, you'll repeat that EGD at one year. If you have confirmed low-grade dysplasia, uh, you're going to proceed with endoscopic eradication therapy. If it's confirmed high-grade dysplasia, again, you will proceed to endoscopic eradication therapy. And uh, if you have a T1A EAC, then you're going to go on to, again, endoscopic eradication. Next, we have a, a guideline from the ASE regarding endoscopic eradication therapy for patients with Barrett's esophagus and associated dysplasia or intramucosal cancer. And it's recommended that there's first, of course, an expert pathologic review and a repeat of that endoscopy with high definition oil at endoscopy at the very least. Um, and uh, you want to do that under maximal acid suppression. You must then remove all visible lesions and of course make decisions based on the highest histologic grade found. If submucosal cancer is found, this should trigger a surgical referral. If there is a low or high grade dysplasia, uh, you can proceed with EET and then of course a surveillance program. How good is eradication? with radiofrequency ablation. Well, this New England Journal article looked at just that with 127 patients randomized two to one, RFA versus sham. And uh, the primary outcome here is a complete eradication of dysplasia. And you can see in the low grade dysplasia group, 90% of the patients in the RFA arm had successful eradication versus only 22% in the sham group. And in the high grade dysplasia, it was 81% complete eradication in the RFA group, where there's only 19% in the sham group. And uh, what about complete eradication of intestinal metaplasia? Well, that was 77.4% in the RFA group, where there's only 2.3% in the sham. So clearly, our RFA does work. Here's another RCT looking at patients with low-grade dysplasia and progression to high-grade dysplasia. And uh, patients were randomized one-to-one -one into RFA versus endoscopic surveillance. And you can see that primary outcome here. Progression to high-grade dysplasia was seen in only 1.5% of patients in the RFA group versus 26% of patients in the control group. So uh, clearly, this uh, is an important tool to have in the armamentarium. Other, uh, other devices on the horizon, we have cryo balloons, okay, that, that are looking promising. In the interest of time, we'll move on from this, but uh, you know, early results, there's no controlled data, but it does look like it's promising and it, it may even uh, serve as a, as a rescue. And uh, of course, we also have the, uh, this new hybrid APC uh, where you can lift the mucosa and ablate it as well. So very encouraging new. In conclusion, endoscopic approaches to the treatment of GERD are becoming more effective and more common and new approaches must be rigorously evaluated prior to broad adoption. Endoscopic eradication therapy for Barrett's is becoming standard of care, and newer devices and approaches may help to limit complications as well as improve long-term outcomes. Thank you for your attention.